going to call the meeting to order. Now here, I'm going to have to have some opening comments here because um, this group has some tough decisions to make. Uh, we'd rather, it might be counterproductive for you to um, have outbursts and um, uh, make this meeting more frustrating than it needs to be. Uh, the way these meetings have to go is that there can't be outbursts from the audience. There's no applause, there's no boos. That's, that's not how it works. So we're going to go through a meeting here and there might be at some point a public hearing, at which point each one of you will be able to come forward and express your point of view on an, on an issue that, that's important to you. But we can't allow outbursts or I'm going to have to adjourn the meeting. Until someone is removed from the council chambers. Okay, Mr. Crook. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, the first item on tonight's agenda is a presentation. I'd like to invite uh, Mr. John Wolf and Mr. Martin Wyant from the Share Family and Community Services who are here to provide an update on their activities and services. Mr. Wolf. Mayor Stewart, members of council, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for giving us the opportunity to uh, speak with you tonight. Um, on behalf of Share Family and Community Services, this year of 2010 has been a uh, challenging and exciting year for us. Uh, we've undergone some leadership changes in the organization and we've con continued to uh, deal with the challenges uh, of needy people in our communities. Um, I want to officially thank you tonight for your continued support and particularly your recent uh, participation in the Tri-Cities Challenge for the Christmas in July uh, program for the food bank. Uh, we clearly had a winner on that, and the winner was all the people that come to the food bank and require those services. So thank you for your leadership in that and your participation. I know that many of you here have already had the opportunity to meet Martin Wyant, our new CEO. Martin started with us in July, beginning of July of this year. Uh, he hails from Sault Ste. Marie. Um, I think there's some other folks in the room that are from that end of the country as well. Um, Martin has extensive uh, experience in both the for-profit and non-profit sector, and we're very pleased to welcome him to the Share family and to our communities here, and I'm going to turn it over to him to uh, share a few pieces of information with you this evening. Thank you. Thank you, John, Mr. Mayor, members of council, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for this opportunity. Um, while I'm speaking, John is just going to show you what uh, members uh, that come to our food bank receive for a family of four every two weeks. So you can get some sense of that and, and what your work goes towards. Um, I have met a number of, of councillors and a number of staff and, and I'd like to thank each of you that I have met with for welcoming me to the Lower Mainland and to the Tri-Cities and to Coquitlam specifically. It's been an interesting uh, move for my family and I and, and we very much have enjoyed our time here. And one of the things that has struck me since coming here, and I'm very happy to see it, is just the, the spirit of generosity that permeates the communities that we're serving. And that plays itself out uh, fabulously with respect to the support that we receive for our food bank and a lot of other things that we do. I did want to mention specifically uh, the efforts of Councillor Robinson. Uh, she's uh, provided a lot of great behind the scenes work and service towards uh, helping us out in the food bank, and to Mayor Stewart for coming out to uh, all of the events, and Mayor Sikora and uh, acting Mayor Sikora in his absence. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. I know your schedules are extremely busy. Uh, this year, we had a wildly successful event between the, the Tri Cities, and we raised approximately seventy thousand dollars in financial gifts and thirty thousand dollars or thirty thousand pounds of food overall. It was desperately needed. Our, our shelves in the summertime were very, very empty, as, as those of you who came out to see us can attest to. So we want to thank you very much for your, your ongoing support. 57% uh, of the people that receive our services through the food bank are, Co are Coquitlam residents. So uh, your efforts certainly go to help your, your neighbors and friends. Um, so in closing, uh, we just want to Thank you again, uh, let you know as well that we hope we can count on your support and, and the support of all of Coquitlam as we move into the Christmas season, which is, is one of our uh, key parts of the year. I haven't been through one yet here, but I understand that it's very busy 
and we get uh, wonderful volunteer support and, and uh, fundraising support in the community. So I'm hopeful that we'll be able to see that again. And I look forward to, uh, to uh, connecting with all of you as, as we do our works in the community. Thank you very much. So I just want to add a couple of comments regarding the, uh, the food hamper that's here. As Martin said, that's a family of four every two weeks. Um, a little bit more gets added to it most weeks because we'll get a bulk uh, shipment of bread or something in from uh, supermarkets or suppliers. So it gets uh, you know, supplemented a little bit. What I find very interesting is that for many, many years when I heard about the food bank, I thought, okay, people go there every week and they get food to feed their family for the week. And then when I got involved with SHARE, I saw they go every two weeks and this is what a family of four gets. Uh, so it's certainly not enough to feed a family for two weeks. And it's only a supplement on food. They still have all of the other challenges and expenses to deal with. So um, I think it's important to keep in mind, you know, they, we do a lot of good help, a lot of people with the food bank, but it is still quite limited. So that makes it even more important that uh, we recognize and thank everybody for their ongoing support. We have such generous communities, it's great. Thank you. If anybody has any questions, we're happy to entertain them. And in your words, it makes it very important for us to recognize and acknowledge the work that SHARE does, all its volunteers, its board of directors, all its supporters. Uh, a lot of families at risk of homelessness in our community, a lot of families that are struggling, and you, you make life a lot easier for a great many of them. And I, on behalf of Council, we acknowledge in you and thank you. I have a question from Councillor Sakura. Yeah, thank you very much. I was at your place in, uh, in Port Moody, and you certainly are proud for space in there. I mean, the, the staff was tripping over, but the, it's amazing that everybody was in such good humor and good uh, uh, working hard to see that things do happen, and, uh, and I'm delighted that you're there and the work that you do. You really are a great addition to our communities, you know, and uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. Item two is the minutes of the regular council meeting held Monday, October 18th. Recommendations to approve those minutes. Second. Moved by Councillor Lynch, second by Councillor McDonnell. All in favor, opposed, carried. Item three is the minutes of the public hearing held Monday, October 25th, with a recommendation to approve those minutes. Moved move by Councillor Reamer, second by Councillor Nicholson. All in favor, opposed, carried. Item four is the minutes of the regular council meeting held Monday, October 25th, recommendations to approve those minutes. Second. Moved by Councillor Asmus, and second by Councillor Sikora. All in favor, opposed, carried. Item five is the minutes of the Recreation, Sports and Culture Standing Committee meeting, which was held Monday, October 25th. Recognitions to receive those minutes. Moved by Councillor Lynch, second by Councillor Nicholson. All in favor, opposed, carried. Item of business arising out of that committee's meeting concerns the naming of Marguerite Park and Millard Park. Recognitions that council direct staff to rename Millard Park. Move recommendation. Second. Moved by Councillor McDonnell, uh, second by Councillor Nicholson. All in favor? Opposed? Excuse me. Oops. Councillor Asmussen. Thank you very much. Um, I have some comments to make on this. I wasn't at the committee meeting there. Um, Millard Park, or potentially Millard Park or Millard Street, where it's off of, our pioneers in the Northeast community have been there since around 1925. This is a neighborhood park, not a destination park. It is in the future to serve probably 80 homes within that area. So I don't understand, even if it was named Millard Park, that it would cause any confusion in the community as to people wanting to go there because it's not a sports designation. No baseball diamonds, no sports fields, that type of thing up there. But what I also would like to suggest that a recommendation that for naming of any parks within the Northeast and the new development, that you consult and work with the Northeast Ratepayers Associations for those names of those parks in that area and, and deal with their recommendations coming back to staff on the naming of those. But this time I don't see the, the, the reasons or the Millard and Millard bill to change them because it's not a destination park. It's only serving 80 or 100 homes that will be right in that area. Thank you. Is that a motion? 
I'm moving a motion that we that consult you... with the Northeast Ratepayers Association. Okay. Um, the motion is to, to consult prior to coming back with a report, I guess. Mm hmm That's right. On okay. The... And it was seconded by Councillor Sikora. Any discussion on the motion? It would be an amendment. Discussion on the amendment. The amendment that staff directs, uh, council directs staff to rename, uh, to essentially report back to council on the renaming of Millard Park after consulting with the Northeast uh, Sector Ratepayers Association. Yep. Okay, that's the amendment. Uh, any further discussion on that? All in favor of the amendment? Opposed? <coughs> Carried unanimously. The motion as amended. Any just further discussion? The uh, challenge before us was the potential conflict if someone put in their GPS to go to Millard and they ended up at Millard Park or something like that, uh, given that Millardville is uh, a pretty similar name. Um, okay, any further discussion? Seeing none. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Item 6 is the minutes of the Land Use and Economic Development Standing Committee meeting held Monday, October 25th. The recommendations that these minutes be received. So moved. Moved by Councillor Reamer. Second by Councillor Nicholson. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. First time of business arising out of that committee's meeting concerns a preliminary report on the citywide official community plan amendment bylaw number 4166 and the zoning amendment bylaw 4167. Uh, these pertain to 3030 Gordon Avenue. The committee's recommendation is that council give first reading to City of Coquitlam citywide official community plan amendment bylaw 4166. The council give first reading to City of Coquitlam zoning amendment bylaw 4167 and that these two bylaws and their related applications be referred to public hearing. Moved by Councillor McDonnell, second by Councillor Nicholson. Councillor Reed. Thank you. Um, I know this is causing a great deal of angst for these neighbourhoods and we sat here three years ago with a whole bunch of other neighbourhoods that are also um, having great concerns about this. When we get something that's this contentious, the fairest thing we can do is move it to all the neighbourhoods that are affected. The three churches, and I live a block away from one of them, that are affected by this all deserve to come and say what they do not like or what they do like about the facilities that are in their area as well. This is, I am going to be moving this to public hearing and this is citywide. Everyone comes and put- We all live there, we live there. Sir, I've got, I've, got to, I've got to ask you. I've got to ask you, sir. This, this actually, this is a council chamber that belongs to all the people. All the people, sir, sir. I'm going to have to ask you. This is all of the people. Well, I'm, I'm afraid this is a democracy, and it doesn't. Uh, in this chamber, it belongs to all of the people of Coquitlam, and this meeting belongs to all of the people of Coquitlam. So we please urge you. There's an application before us that we have to decide on. Can I continue, please, Your Worship? You certainly still because have the floor. Because obviously, Mr. Yapass up there is going to keep going oh, on. Do you know what? We've had just about enough of you, sir. And with, oh, well, that's wonderful. with all due respect, would you like to get the information? Okay. Pardon? Newspaper articles out right now saying how bad it is. Just no. pull on the fence and make room for drug dealers. We yeah. just drugs through. Yeah. Are you going to pay for the show? No, it's not a Okay, I've got to. Okay, please. Order, please, sir. What we're going to have here is a whole bunch of people uh, irritating the very people who have to make a decision on whether or not your concerns are valid. This might be this might be counterproductive. This might be counterproductive if you call us names. We're, we have got some work. We've got some work to do, sir. Sir. Uh, we're going to have a, we're going to have to call. I'll have to call a recess until we have you removed. If that's well, that would be better. Well, I can't. She's got. You want? Do you want to give up the floor for a minute? Do I want to give up the floor to Councillor McDonnell? Councillor McDonnell uh, was hoping sure. to explain.
Go ahead, and I'll finish uh, well, after. Uh, Councillor Reed defers to Councillor uh, Councillor McDonnell. Thank you very much. much. Uh, it's a, it's apparent that everyone here is uh, got something at stake here tonight. But I think what's really important is that you understand what we're doing tonight. What we're going to do tonight, what we're voting on, is we're voting on allowing you to have a say on this so that you can all come up and you can all talk to us and you can talk to the rest of Coquitlam. What we're voting on tonight is to send this to public hearing, November the 29th, so that you can have a chance to have a voice. That's it. We're not debating the pros and the cons of whether we're going to have, a, have what, any kind of a facility at 3030 Gordon. This is strictly tonight, is to put this forward to a public hearing so that you can have a chance to get up and talk to us. People outside our area will decide what we want for our homes. They can tell us how to handle our children. They can tell us how to handle our children. You've, you're going to have all the opportunity you want, sir, on the 29th. On the 29th, that's all we're doing, is we're, we're giving you a forum to be able to tell us, all of you, you can all, we'll be here till 5 o'clock in the morning if you want us to be. Okay? But tonight, tonight is not the forum for it. Tonight is what we're doing, is just a procedure, is, a, is setting it up so that you will be able to, to, to talk to us. Well, this isn't this isn't the forum for debate, sir. Why are we just hearing about this now? This isn't this isn't a secret. Okay. We we've we've actually gone through a process that's a couple of years long. Uh, this has been very public. Every public meeting that, that every meeting that's just been this has been discussed at has been a public meeting. We're actually breaking some procedures here right now, and, I, and I've got to get us back on track because, as Councillor McDonnell said, this is about establishing the third button there. The third one is refer it to a public hearing so that we can hear from people. Because right now we can't, we, our procedures, our procedure bylaw doesn't even permit us to hear from people right now. We can, we can, we can, hear, if you, we can hear if you shout. I'm not sure that's particularly constructive, though. Uh, a public hearing will allow us to receive delegations from the public, all of you, because I've spoken to many of you. I understand your concerns. We all understand your concerns. We've also spoken to lots of people in the community that have serious concerns with the issue of homelessness. So the, ch uh, the challenge before us is, let's try to find a solution to this challenge. Okay, we want to it, it, your it, house. We'll all say yes. Because it's not near our house. And that's what's yeah. going to happen with the rest of Coquitlam. Come on, why don't we send you? Well, now you're going to have to make a decision there. Right now, I'm pretty committed to respecting the values of this community. I hope that you'll be able to respect the values of this council chamber, because the values of this council chamber are established by the democracy we all live in. So please, this, is, this does have procedures, and we can't vary from them. The procedure right now is establish a public hearing so we can all hear from you. Okay. Councillor Reed. Where I was going to is, I live a block away from one of the cold weather map programs. I have lots of neighbors that think That's just three days a year, three days a year. That think yeah. just like you do. And there are neighbors all over this city that are for and against this because it is in their neighborhood. It is next door to them. As a city council, we have a duty to let everybody talk. And at the public hearing, you all come up one by one or in groups or whatever you want, but you hear from everyone. And that's all the process is tonight. That's where I was going and that's what I was trying to explain to you. This is only to move it to public hearing so the whole city gets a chance to stand up and say, I do not want this in my city or we do see that we need this in our city. And that's what we need to hear from. And thank you. I'm done. It's true. No one wants it in their neighborhood. I agree. Uh, however, we're, we, we have a decision to make on one particular application, and that's before us today. And the only way we can make a decision on it is to have it to a public hearing. We're going to have it to a public hearing. I suspect the motion's on the floor. Councillor Sikora. Yeah, thank you very much. One thousand to get it. What do you get out of this? I get, uh, council is trying to help 
challenge, the challenge associated with homelessness. Sir, I, I, sir, this we can't. I, 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 I promise you, I'll talk with you after this because I can't. We, we can't have a debate this way. This is not going to work this way. Councillor Sakora. Thank you very much. Uh, you know. I guess there's a lot of people that are really upset with this, you know, it's a funny darn thing, but, you know, and I guess a lot of you people have a right to be upset because of where it's going. It's going to a neighborhood that the people have felt that there's nice and quiet, and the fact is that, you know, you can't go into your backyard because this is going to be right in your backyard, and for many reasons, you know, the, the, the one thing about it that, you know, that bothers me that the, you know, a mayor, there's other places they can put, put this uh, homeless shelter in. They can put it in yeah. the no, hold, 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 hold. Please. Please, folks, please. You know, they can put it at Riverview Hospital. They can, they can, they can, they can put it in other places. The fact please, that, I beg. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, we can't be doing this. We please have to respect the rules of the, of the council chamber we're in. I, yeah. I ask you to please do that. And Mayor, what happened here that there's open house, and I heard from quite a few of these people that have phoned me, I hear from, the, from this neighbor, from the, the people, that our staff had open house, and the staff were saying, it's a foregone conclusion, forget about it, it's going ahead. And well, actually, no. Councillor Zagor, I was at that, and I didn't hear any staff well, person that, say that that's because. What I, you know what I did. So, what, what, okay, I, sir, council wants to respect your perspective. Please, we ask you the same. Just simply respect the procedures that we're in. Well, but it, it's, again, we, that's it's going to be democratic, here, Councillor Zagor. Again, again, it's hearsay. I don't know whether it was a fact or not. It's hearsay, so I don't know what it's fact or not. But that was brought to my attention. Secondly, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. McIntyre, what happens if we rezone this land to whatever it should accommodate this and the provincial government doesn't come up with the money? What do we do then? Because that's what we're relying on. Okay, so Mr. Stays, Ma Mr. McIntyre, it does, it, does, it, does it go back to industrial? Um, uh, Your Worship, uh, if the zoning is ultimately uh, supported by council, it is also an official committee plan amendment. There's two things happening. Um, the western, or the, pardon me, the eastern third of the site is proposed for the, the shelter facility, and that's the P1 zone. The balance of the property is being proposed for a commercial, service commercial use, and, or pardon me, a general commercial use, and that would be zoned for that. The thinking is that the, the property would be there, the site for the, the shelter would be there available, at that point in time that the provincial government had funding available to proceed on to construction and, and operation. Um, at some future point, it would be council's uh, discretion as to uh, uh, if that funding is not in place and the project wasn't to proceed, the ultimate use of that land would always rest with the city. And, and if I, uh, I know what the, what the law is so on this one, but I'd ask it so the public can know about it. The fact is that, you know, let's say that they have, we have the rezoning and nothing happens the first year. They can ask for extension, right? They can ask for extension before they can start building. The, um, I know it's correct. <clears throat> what is proposed with both the, the OCP, the Fish Committee Plan Amendment, and rezoning is that those bylaws would be taken through for final consideration by council, and again, that's, that's the council's decision at that time, whether to put that OCP designation in place and zoning in place. But that designation stays there if they want to extend it, uh, say, a week before it expires? There, there is no expiry on an OCP designation or a rezoning. Yeah, okay. No, there is. On our land, of course there is. A, uh, the land can be zoned for certain zoning, and if I, let's say, buy a lot and I haven't built the commercial building, then I have to ask for extension, otherwise it expires. And in well, this that, case, that, that only applies to, to a development only? permit. To, yeah. to a yeah. development permit. Yeah, the, well, development permit. The development permit is there for one year, whatever it is, this six is, months. This, this isn't a development permit. This isn't a development permit. Yeah, I know. Development. I know, but you know what? I, I, I know the laws. I know the laws pretty well. But anyways, what happens is that they can keep extending it for 10 years if the council members allow them. Am I correct? At this point, we don't have any... Um, application from the province BC housing for the facility itself. It's simply it's looking at the OCP amendment and rezoning for the property. 
But, but. No, hold on. Come please, on, sir. Folks. Please, folks, please, please, folks. Please. But what happens is the fact is I know that you haven't got an application for a developer. You have no application mm -hmm. for anything outside of that we're pre zoning the land. And I remember years ago, we wanted to pre zone 12 piece of land that the city owned, and there was a lot more people than these people in the council chamber screaming their head off. Because forever and a day, the zoning, you don't really know what can go on there. Another thing that bothers me, and uh, you know, I guess here's the place to voice it. What happens if Mr. Thiessen comes with these containers? And, they, and he says, and the council members allowed those containers to go there, and I'm, I'm asking this. Uh, uh, no one's they, interrupting you. you because, because that was brought up, those containers, which I'm totally opposed to containers. So, so what happens, those containers go in there, and then the provincial government says, well, the containers are there. We don't have to put any more money to look after these people, and those containers are there forever and a day. Is that a good thing to look at for these neighbors or not? I don't think so. See, and another thing, that that building, that, was, uh, that the architect, whoever drew up that building, uh, the architect, it was an ugly, ugly looking building. <laughs> it was. <laughs> no, hold on, hold on. Folks, please, please. So, you know, uh, what I'd like to see, Mayor, is really, and I hope that you would push this yourself, to make sure that A, the provincial government comes up with the money. Because pre-zoning land is very dangerous if the provincial government does not come to the table. So I've got difficulty with that. I've got to do a lot of thinking between now and, and November 29th. I want to listen to the people on November 29th, but I tell you to the planning department, those are my concerns. And really, I, you know, I think that we need to think about it because I, I will not pre-zone land if there's no money involved in it. Okay? Thank you very much. Okay. Um, and in fairness, the reason... And I'll, and I'll go for a first reading just so I can listen to the public. And, and in fairness, the reason that uh, this is being considered at this point is because the province has said essentially the same thing. If you advance the zoning, we uh, will hopefully be able to come up with the money faster. So there's almost a chicken and egg here. Um, but it's not specific to a, a, a given. It's not specific to a given site. I see no. I, I, knew, I see no other speakers. Um, the motion on the floor. All in favor? Opposed? And it's carried unanimously. And the, 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 so then, Mr. Clerk, the the public hearing. We'd ask you all to to please come and uh, we'd welcome your letters, your your specific information about issues or attendance and or attendance at the public hearing, the public hearing. Um, um, Mr. Clerk. Next item. Sir, sir, uh, thanks. Mr. Clerk. We appreciate the concerns here. You're very important. I appreciate the process we're trying to follow through. I think the concern from the community is that if you take this to a forum where there are nine other communities who find this project equally distasteful to their local neighborhoods, the voice of the one community that might be I understand, sir. Now, the, the vote has been taken, so there will be a public hearing. I, I'd urge you to make those, those comments, if you wish, at the public hearing, or even write us after this meeting. Or, and I'll be here afterwards uh, to speak to anyone that wants to raise any questions. Miss, Mr. Uh, it was... It, And for those of you who were respectful of our procedures, I thank you very much. I'm going to call a two-minute recess, please.
to call the meeting back to order. Thank you all for your patience. Thank, Thank you. The next item on the agenda is item 6.8. It concerns a preliminary report on an application for a zoning amendment by law 4165 and the 5% parkland dedication requirements for a proposed subdivision at 3362 Mason Avenue. Recommendations that council give first reading to zoning amendment by law 4165. Yeah. Um, that the zoning amendment bylaw 4165 and its related application be referred to public hearing and the owner of the proposed subdivision under this application provide 5% cash in lieu to address the provisions of the LGA. Moved by Councillor Reid, second by Councillor Asmundson. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Item 6.9 is the authorization for the issuance of a development variance permit and a development permit for an addition to an existing industrial building at 915 Tupper Avenue. Um, perhaps prior to moving the recommendation, I would uh, <coughs> ask the chair to invite members from the audience who may wish to speak to this DVP. Okay, now oddly enough, this actually is a public hearing portion for this item only because it's a development variance permit and so under the rules of our uh, chamber, we're going to call for people who wish to speak to this item on the development variance permit. Are there any speakers to this item? A second time, are there any speakers to this item? Third and final time, any speakers to this item? Seeing none, Mr. Clerk. Thank you. The recommendation is that Council approve the signing and sealing and development variant permit and that the Mayor and City Clerk be authorized to execute this permit on behalf of the City of Coquitlam and that Council also approve the signing and sealing of the associated developments permit and that the Mayor and City Clerk be authorized to execute it on behalf of the City. Second. Moved by Councillor Reamer, seconded by Councillor Nicholson. All in favour? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Next item, item 610, is also a, an authorization for the issuance of a development variance permit. This is for 1943 Custer Court. Uh, again, prior to reading the recommendation, I would uh, ask the chair to invite speakers. Thank you very much. Uh, similar to the last one, uh, any speakers to this item on a development variance permit? A second time, any speakers to this item? Third and final time, any speakers to this item? Seeing none. The staff recommendations that Council approve the signing and sealing of this DVP for 1943 Custer Court and that the Mayor and the City Clerk be authorized to execute it on behalf of the City. Moved, Moved by Councillor Reamer, second by Councillor Lynch. Councillor Reed. Yes, um, I said this at the Land Use Committee and I'm going to say it again. I'm not voting in favour of this and it has to do with the proximity of the um, building towards the slope. I have been here when we've lost several of our taxpayers to Port Moody as they slid down the slope. And I, I just think it's a bit premature. We're doing an integrated watershed management plan next year on the stability of this very slope. And this house is not even within our own bylaws. So I'm having difficulty with this, so I will be voting against it. And those are my reasons, not because of the building or anything about it, but I just don't have a good feeling about this. Thank you very much. Seeing no other speakers, motion, motion is before us. All in favor? Opposed? Councillor Reed is opposed. The motion carries. Item 612 concerns the zoning bylaw text amendment to the CS1 service commercial zone. It's bylaw 4164. Um, it relates to 1500 Lloyd Highway. The recommendations the council give first reading to zoning amendment bylaw 4164. That bylaw 4164 and its related application be referred to public hearing. Moved by Councillor Asmussen, second by Councillor Reamer. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Item 613 is also a zoning bylaw text amendment to the, but it's to the RS7, RS8, RS10, and RS11 single family zones. Um, Bylaw number 4163. Recognition that Council give first reading to City of Coquitlam Zoning Amendment Bylaw 4163 and that Bylaw 4163 and its related application be referred to public hearing. Second. Moved by Councillor Reed, seconded by Councillor Nicholson. All in favour? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Next item concerns a 5% provision of parkland pursuant to the section 941 of the LGA for the proposed subdivision at 3421 Queenston Avenue. Recognitions that council require the owner of the proposed subdivision um, on Queenston Avenue to provide cash in lieu equaling 5% of the market value of the lands being subdivided in order to address the provisions of the LGA. Moved by Councillor Lynch, second by Councillor Reamer. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. 
Item 615, uh, 615, sorry, uh, concerns the development application process improvements update. The recommendation is that a copy of the report of the general manager of planning and development titled uh, development application process improvements be forwarded to the UDI for their information. Uh, moved by Councillor Reamer, second by Councillor Nicholson, and Councillor Asmussen. Thank you very much. I just want to uh, thank Mr. McIntyre for all the good work that they've been doing on this. One of the issues when I came on Council was working out streamlining some of our processes, and uh, you and staff have taken a, a, a good run at this and improving things. One part I think is really important on the future is the implementation of the, the electronic plan review. I hope that gets support and goes ahead. It'll really help modernize and speed up some of the process, but I just want to let you know, good work. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the motion is to forward it to UDI. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Item 7 is the minutes of the Engineering Utilities and Environment Standing Committee meeting of Monday, October 25th. Recommendations to receive those minutes. Second. Moved by Councillor Lynch, second by Councillor Reamer. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. <coughs> item 7.3 um, involves an on table item report. Uh, there are copies available at the back and have been distributed to members of Council. Um, the Engineering and Utilities Environment Standing Committee did not make a recommendation with respect to the item, but uh, asked staff to provide further information and an alternate recommendation. This is before you. It's a four-part recommendation, and uh, I can put it on the overhead projector if you'd like, or I assume that the copies in front of you are sufficient. Um, essentially, it's to confirm support for the 70% waste diversion target and express in goals one and two. Um, endorse the specific municipal actions of goals one and two subject to the following conditions. Um, that the degree to which each action is implemented will depend on the feasibility and affordability at the local government level as determined by council. Does not constitute endorsement of eco centers or any other similar race regional waste date depots unless or other until further financial aid or operation detail confirm the cost effectiveness is assured and the Coquitlam retains its rights with regard to evaluating its options. Um, that the mayor be authorized to send a letter to the new Minister of Environment rewriting, reiterating council's concerns regarding the process and content of this draft and its request that consideration for future disclosure options, um, including open market call for all feasible site specific alternatives and that staff be directed to report back to council with a detailed analysis of the municipal actions identified for goals one and two. Are you done? <laughs> I believe so. <laughs> The longest one. Just about. Is there a motion? Moved by Councillor Asmussen. Second, Second by Councillor Reamer. Councillor Sikora. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor. You know, I'll tell you, I, the more I read about Metro Vancouver, the more my hair stands up. And uh, probably I should be pulling it out to where I don't have any. But I'll tell you, this, this beast is uh, our octopus is just totally growing out of control. And I know that our two board of directors are trying to handle this situation with the GVD, with the Metro Vancouver as much as possible. But I'll tell you something, when you look at their budgets, it's just totally out of proportion. They've grown up to 9% increase in budget to, that we just voted on the last uh, few days. They, in their public relations, they have 50 employees, just in their public relations. In their budget, they got 25 new employees they're gonna hire. They've got a ranch that they bought in Ashcroft 1998 for $10 million. This ranch now cost them $22 million because I noticed in their budget, that they're subsidizing that ranch to the tune of 1.1 1. Odd, 1. 1 odd million dollars a year. So you take 12 years, that's $12 million, add it on to the 20, 10 million, it's $22 million. And frankly, I don't know what they're gonna do unless it'll be a retirement for, uh, for the head guy for the GVD, Johnny Carlisle, and maybe the, the, the chairman, uh, Lois Jackson, to retire on that ranch. You know, that might be a good place, but however, you know, to me, it's a bottomless pit with these people. They just seem to be growing and growing and growing. And one thing that Mayor Stewart mentioned, that they do have their own fire department now. 
They have, they, they have a fire department just in case there's a fire somewhere. Can you imagine? I don't know where those fire trucks are stored, but can you imagine the, going somewhere wherever they may live, these firemen going all the way to the GVD, wherever the trucks are stored, to go up to the fire, to put out a fire. There'd be nothing left. But anyways, in any case, every municipality has their own fire department, and they're close to everything that the Metro Vancouver may own, but however, that's not good enough. So, you know, and I hear some that they also may have their own airport. You know, I don't know how true that is, but I hear they may have their... It's true. It's not a very big airport. <laughs> it's not a big airport, that's right. But, uh, but I'll tell you what, the way they handle their budget, it may become a pretty big airport in a, in a few years' time. So, you know, I'm, I'm glad that we're going to be writing it to the minister, uh, this letter to the minister. And, and the tipping fees, I mean, you can ha ha hold on to your hat, the tipping fees from, is going to grow from 90, next year it'll be $96, but it's going to go up to $152. Can you imagine every household having to pay that increase after the last couple of years, we've had a huge increase. In that, uh, but they also, in their last year's budget, that's been approved, they got $500 million for incinerator. And they also have $40 million to take over all the recycling plants that uh, Mr. Susak and myself went and seen in Lower Mainland, and we were quite happy what we seen. And I'm sure there'll be more new ones coming aboard. So leave it to the private industry that's not costing us no $40 million. And they're also talking that this thing will cost to carry on, that this will cost us about three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars a year to carry on with what they're what they're trying to do. So I don't know. I don't know where this outfit is coming from, and I and I appreciate the two board of directors trying to fight their way uh, out of this, but it seems like it's a thing that's just going to keep going. So, uh, frankly, I'll tell you anything to do with Metro Vancouver just makes me shiver because uh, it's it just gone on and on and on. And uh, yeah, here it is. Increase could be in the order of 300,000 to 500,000 annually. And if you don't think that this is out of proportion, well, I don't know what is out of proportion. So there's no way I can support these kind of increases. I will support this because there's a lot of going to the minister outlining the fire dissatisfaction and what I think it should be doing. Uh, I can see that Metro Vancouver should stay out of the business because I don't think they know how to run a business to begin with. Uh, I noticed also in their budget that they're also showing a loss in the housing. The housing department shows a loss in their budget. And every department you look at, there's either a loss or, or something that's red circled that they've got a problem with. Well, I've got a problem with all of uh, Metro Vancouver as far as their budgeting and the way they budget. And uh, uh, the times are tough. People can't afford to pay any more taxes. And here's one that just keeps climbing and climbing. And who are they? Who are they? Are they an elected body? No. Are they, is Metro Vancouver part of, uh, uh, are we a baby of Metro Vancouver? Is the Metro Vancouver was born by the municipalities. So I don't know why the municipalities don't say one day to Metro Vancouver, thank you very much, you'll go to the original reason why you were there, for sewer and water only, thank you very much, close every department down. And I can't think of a better place with a GVD housing. Now with the vacancy rate that they have, and the, and the losses that they have, why they, they don't turn it over to uh, homeless shelters or affordable housing. That'd be a great idea, I think. Anyways, we can maybe uh, write them a letter to that in fact, see what they say to okay, us. Well, but anyways, yeah, this one is about uh, garbage, I but go ahead. But anyways, okay. that's uh, what actually is happening with the Metro Bank mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay. And I'll reserve my comments for a, a moment. I'll just clarify one thing. The uh, airport that we're talking about is actually run by the Metro Vancouver Parks Department because it's an air park. Um, and and uh, it's called Boundary Bay Air Park. And um, I actually got a chance to tour it uh, at some point. And they, they have planes. Councillor McDonnell. We're going to talk about the solid waste now? Apparently, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, 
I like the direction that uh, GVR or Metro Vancouver is taking with solid waste. We have to uh, limit our, our footprint on this planet. However, going green comes at a cost and it's, it's expensive to uh, implement a lot of the initiatives that uh, the GVR or Metro Vancouver wants to uh, initiate. I agree with them. However, our tipping fees are going to double in the next few years. And reading in the report, things that worry me, um, um, staff actually don't know what a lot of these costs are going to be in the future. And we're going to have to just to deal with them as we get to them. Well, Metro Vancouver is also uh, working very hard on all, all the rest of the utilities. We, we've seen a huge increase in water fees. We've seen a huge increase in uh, solid waste fees. And it's all getting hit in our pocketbooks in our, in, at uh, tax time. I agree with, the plan, with, with their plan. I agree with the direction they're heading. But I don't agree with implementing all, uh, this all at once. I think the taxpayer is getting hit in the pocket uh, from a multitude of angles all at the same time. And I think that it's, it's, it's too difficult on the average taxpayer to, to be looking at all these um, um, big increases all at once, and especially for, for this council to be um, putting our stamp of approval on, um, a, a, on a plan that we really don't know what the cost is going to be at the end. So I, I don't think I could, I'm, I'm not going to be able to, to endorse this as it is now. I'd like to see it integrated a little slower. I'd like to see, and the reasons for that, of course, is to make it a little easier on the taxpayer. But uh, I agree with the direction, just not with the timing. Thank you. Councillor Reid. Thank you. Um, I also am just, I'm just appalled at the cost of, of this and where we're going. I certainly agree that we need the 70% waste diversion target, even though it is ambitious. I believe that we can make it. I know in our city we're at 50%. Um, I think there are lots of things that we can be doing, but the costs are um, the costs are truly what um, what we have to be concerned about. This is almost a third level of government that sort of inserted itself in our lives and. I think we've been saying over the past few months we've been involved in the new regional growth strategy and believe me ladies and gentlemen this and the water and the pipes and everything they're all intertwined and this is a huge huge octopus as Councillor Sikora calls it. Um, I wouldn't support the original recommendation but the one out on the blue sheet um, we have a lot of subjects in it and I thank uh, the engineering committee, I believe it was, or the engineers for coming back and at least trying to lead us down the path but not too quickly because the costs of this could be enormous and uh, pretty soon none of us will be able to afford to live in the Metro Vancouver area. I will hold my nose and vote for this uh, only because of the new recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Nicholson. Thank you, Your Worship. Well, I don't have the advantage that Councillor Sikora has of having been around forever, and so I don't have a whole laundry list of reasons to be concerned about Metro Vancouver. I just have an instinct to be concerned about Metro Vancouver. So I'll reduce this to, to a very specific. At the Engineering Committee, although I'm not a member, I spoke. I talked about whether or not eco centers were an appropriate thing for Metro Vancouver to take charge of. I noted that their capital plan, I was at their budget consultation, calls for them to spend $45 million establishing eco centers throughout Metro Vancouver over the next five years. I think $14 million next year in one location alone. It's huge amounts of money. Eco centers, recycling centers, title them as you will. Different municipalities in our region have gone different distances in establishing those things. Here in Coquitlam, we've done a good deal. We certainly could do more. But I don't think we need the regional government taking on that role 
and providing it to everyone in the region regardless of how far they've gotten already. I think that's something that can very well be done right here locally. I expressed that that was one of the reasons that this addendum was prepared to reflect some of those things. Our staff in preparing these documents are unfailingly polite. They set a wonderful example for some in our community in their politeness. I'm going to move a, an amendment to recommendation 2B and I'm going to ask that we strike at the end of that paragraph the words regarding the establishment of such centers with the words as to so further discussion with Metro Vancouver and member municipalities as to the need for Metro Vancouver to have any role at all in this area. I suggest that an amendment like that much more clearly states my concern. That Metro, we, we need Metro to make the case for their need to be involved before we simply say, oh, okay, let's go along and they can do the studies and come up with it. And I'd seek a seconder for that amendment. I'll second that. Okay, as I got that, the, uh, well, we're going to have to switch now uh, to dealing with the amendment. And I'm going to ask for hands to speak on the amendment, or do you want to do QB? Uh, I will enable QB now. Okay, uh, if anyone has to want to speak to the amendment. Well, actually, I will. I will. Um, it's funny that uh, eco centers came up. It has come up a couple of times at Metro Vancouver table, partly because um, there are several communities that have those recycling centers. I can't think of a community that has spent $14 million, which is about the price of a large school uh, or a swimming pool or something, establishing a, a, an eco center. But uh, we have a recycling center. Burnaby has a very uh, good one. And Burnaby's question was, why would Burnaby have to establish its own and then Metro Vancouver establish one in Surrey? and et cetera. So I raised the same question there. I know Councillor Asmundson has raised the same question, is why does Metro Vancouver have a role in, in this? And uh, I think the amendment is entirely in order and entirely appropriate, so I'm going to support it. Any other speakers to that? Saying none. The question is the amendment uh, to ask why Metro Vancouver has any role. All in favor? Oh, did you have something? Okay. Okay, Councillor Lynch on, that, on the amendment. Well, I'm just, I'm just reading the report. It says that the Provincial Environment, Environmental Protection Act, Metro Vancouver, is required to prepare a solid waste management plan that benefits all member municipalities. So I think that they're directed to have a role. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I, sus I suspect what they're... I suspect, suspect they have a role in picking up garbage, but what they've really done is delegated it to local communities to pick up the garbage. Um, I don't know. Councillor Nicholson. On Councillor Lynch's point, I think that's a perfectly good point. Well, what it says is that they have a role, they're, they're required to prepare the plan. They're not required to execute. Their plan can suggest that we should all have eco-centers. And that's as far as they need to go. The planning function on a regional basis is a good idea. Implementation, having the regional spread the costs over all the municipalities, those who've already spent on an equal footing with those who haven't spent it all makes no sense at all to me. Thank you. Okay. Any further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none. On the amendment, all in favor? Opposed? Uh, the amendment carries unanimously on the, on the motion as amended. Any further discussion? We'll go back to QA, and I see Councillor Nicholson on the main motion. Nothing further. Thank you. Councillor Lynch on the main motion. Thank you. Well, um, I wasn't in favor of this recommendation when it came forward to our committee, and uh, even with all the uh, information, endorsements, and everything that's been put on here, I'm no, I still am not in favor of this for many of the reasons that have already been said, uh, but it comes right down to $500,000 is 0.5 on our tax base, and we're entering a very difficult year, and for us just to simply say, oh, well, we're just going to do that. I do note in the report it states that um, Metro Vancouver has the authority to make bylaws and regulations that municipalities must abide by, and the province does not require municipal endorsement. So, I mean, there's a saying about when you're on the cliff, you either jump or you get pushed, and I say, let them push me, I'm not going to vote for this. Very good. Councillor, uh, Councillor Askinson. Thank you very much. Um, I like the recommendations that staff brought back. I think they deal with some of the issues, if I'm correct, Mayor Stewart, that 
at the Metro Board, North Van, a bunch of cities raised the eco center issue and it was pulled out for a separate um, discussion on eco centers. The eco center that was discussed about the 14 million was to be in Surrey and there was not a lot of support about eco centers around the board. Um, there's a lot of concern about them because a lot of cities already have some established. We have private areas establish them and why does Metro Vancouver have to go in and duplicate or get in the way of those eco centers making their profit because they need that recycling material to make a profit. Um, Metro Vancouver has passed its budget. The tipping fees are going to be set. Those costs are going to be set. Uh, the first part of the uh, A which reads the degree to which actions are implemented will depend on the feasibility and affordability at the local government level as determined by council. So we have the flexibility and ability to deal with that. We moved just recently, which is a cost, and this council endorsed for green waste, well, organic waste pickup within our green waste. And that's a change, that's a cost of separating out some organic and material in our waste system. Um, this is not 300 to 500,000 a year. This is an approximate cost that staff see, maybe a one-time cost for education and advertising, but not full cost on an ongoing basis. Are the costs undetermined? Yes, they are at this time, but staff will be coming back to council with what our implementations are. And I'll agree with what Metro Vancouver is a very high level because getting to 70% diversion, we're at 55, we want to go to 70 by 2015, is a very difficult and it will increase cost to make that diversion rate. Metro Vancouver, rather than saying that as a, a, the ultimate goal, has set that as the minimum standard. They have said 70% is the minimum we want to get to and we want to go to 80 or 90, which I don't know if we'll ever get to that point. Um, the other tipping fee costs are based on the decision which Councillor Stewart and I wanted to put more options with this report talks about um, a call for proposals on the waste to energy because the $500 million is what Metro Vancouver is out for proposal calls right now on waste to energy. The doubling of tipping fees from 77 to 152 is based on the need for those for a waste to energy facility estimated at a cost of $500 million. It's not in their budgets and it's a, it's a marker. I don't think it'll be that cheap. I think it'll be a lot more than that. And Metro Vancouver does have some of these goals that trickle down to us and cause us grief. But the, the costs have already been passed by the Metro Board last Friday. Council Mayor Stewart and I both voted against the Metro Vancouver budget, but it passed. So those costs will increase by Metro Vancouver, will affect our local tax rate to our tipping fees. The one way to reduce our ability on those tipping fee increasing costs are once again to reduce the tonnage or the waste that comes out of our community will save us our costs. Um, I'm going to support this. I think for now this highlights the ideas and concerns that Coquitlam Council has. We do have the ability to modify and deal with the cost and implementation moving forward. It's right on the A of the second part of it. So that's why I'm going to support this and move forward. And um, I once again I'll tell a lot of people Metro Vancouver is a third level of government trying to become and uh, we at this table and our directors have been pointing that out and trying to do our best to rein in Metro Vancouver but it's a very big operation. Thank you very much. Thank you Councillor Asmussen. Um, I have a few comments of my own. Uh, Councillor Asmussen pointed out some of the challenges. We do have, the uh, Metro Vancouver Board has some unique challenges. Uh, Metro Vancouver, as Councillor Sakura has said, continues to, conti to grab at things, to continues to almost, uh, as an octopus would, continues to expand its, its role, its mandate, uh, and uh, really almost unchecked. And I think we have to find a way to bring balance back into the, the continued expansion of Metro Vancouver's mandate. The, as Councillor McDonnell said, there is a cost to being green, and, uh, but there's an even greater cost to being reckless. And I think sometimes we end up with costs being incurred by Metro Vancouver at a much higher, at much faster rate, higher levels of cost than any of the local communities would by themselves choose to do. Like I can't even imagine a $14 million recycling center, and yet that's where we're at at Metro Vancouver. And it's a, 
There was a comment made at the board uh, the other day, well, it's only a million dollars. Now, the, the comment was made with tongue-in-cheek by uh, Councillor Mayor McLean from uh, Pitt Meadows. He was saying, we've got to stop saying it's only a million dollars. And that's the challenge, is that at Metro Vancouver, the numbers are bigger, so they're perhaps even, yeah, b because each of us has a small share, easier to ignore. I want us to be green. I want us to be responsible with the way in which we spend money, though. And in the coming weeks, I think residents will come to realize uh, the, eff the effects of some of Metro Vancouver's decisions on our utility rates, uh, particularly on water, on garbage. We'll have some decisions made in, in the coming months on, uh, on liquid waste that will, um, I think, make a lot of people angry, a lot of our residents angry. They'll turn the anger at us because we're the ones whose name is at the top of the utility bill, but the, the costs are really being passed on from costs that Metro Vancouver are causing every resident of Metro Vancouver to incur in their utility bills, in their taxes. And uh, that's the challenge before us, is how do we wrestle that to the ground? And that's a big one. Uh, Councillor Sikor is back on. Yeah, thank you very much, Mayor. The, not a problem. Uh, uh, Councillor Sikor, I'm going to let you speak, but you've already spoken once, yeah. and you spoke this for seven minutes, which is longer. And the amendment's already passed. Okay. You voted for it. So on the, um, did, did you have any further comments on the motion uh, as amended? No, that's fine. Okay. And. Likewise, Councillor Lynch, did you have something clarifying? I have an additional comment out to you that came out rose from comments made from people who spoke after me, and that was that the, uh, the Metro Vancouver being a third level of government, and you talking about how we're going to rein these, uh, this level of government in, and I know at least twice since I've been elected onto council, we've called for a member, we need to start really considering how we're going to make it so that Metro Vancouver directors are directly elected so that they become a little more accountable. Because I don't believe it's working right now the way we have people who are elected to council who then go on to, to represent the council at Metro Vancouver. So now you made some comments, so I wanted to just tack on to that. Yeah, fair comment. Okay. There are several of us that would want uh, uh, greater accountability at Metro Board. Seeing no further discussion, uh, the motion is on the floor as amended. All in favor? All opposed? Councillor Lynch is opposed. Councillor McDonnell is opposed. The motion carries. Item 7-4 is an update on soil substance removal fees. Uh, the recommendation is that Council approve the increase in fees to 56 cents per cubic meter, phased in over three years. The staff be directed to amend the existing bylaw to reflect this increase. The staff be directed to review the fee every three years, and the staff uh, review char charges for excavation and deposition of soils on private property. I'll turn to the chair of that committee, Councillor Asmundson, who pushed his button first. Thank you very much. We've had a request from the gravel operators to come before Council to explain their views on this report and I don't have a problem with that moving forward so I'll put that out for council if they would like to consider a deferment of this report until two weeks time or so when the gravel operation can be arranged to come and speak before our council. So I'll move that. I'll second. I'll second. Councillor Asmundson moves a <coughs> deferral uh, for until we can have a uh, deferral of the report, probably not the implementation but the report until we can have the uh, uh, gravel operators here. Councillor Lynch seconded that. Uh, speakers to that. Councillor Asmussen, anything further? That's fine. That's I'm done. Uh, Councillor uh, Reamer, anything? Uh, thank you. No, I uh, fully support uh, deferment of this uh, to give uh, the uh, gravel operators an opportunity uh, to present to us on those uh, two dates. I note that we did uh, make that offer to them way back in January 11th of 2010 and um, Although it was uh, removed from a recommendation on February the 8th, uh, I still think that uh, um, we ought to give them an opportunity uh, to present uh, from all of them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Reed. Um, I was going to move deferral, so I'm happy. Okay, Councillor Nicholson. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm in favor of deferring in order to hear from the gravel operators, but I'd like to confirm with the Director of Finance that this won't impact our budget deliberations. That short delay. Ms. Through the Chair, um, that will have no impact on our budget. This, this money goes straight into a reserve and is used for capital funding of roadworks. Thank you. In any case, I gather that we're the, uh, the deference would only be to the uh, consideration of the report and not necessarily to the implementation dates in the report. Okay, motion is deferral. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. 
Item 7-6 concerns traffic signal cabinet decorative anti-graffiti wraps. Uh, the recognition that council endorsed the proposal um, that for the 2011 traffic signaling operation program that it be adjusted to include provision for six additional cabinets to be wrapped. Um, that staff be directed to include the installation of decorative wraps on any new traffic signal cabinets. That staff be directed to encourage other agencies who have similar types of things uh, to require appropriate wrapping of new development installed cabinets. Second. And I like the one with the Moved by Councillor Reed, second by Councillor Asmundson, and it had nothing to do with the ones with the flowers. Councillor Sikora. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor. The, I noticed that at the end of August we had 49 vacancies, but uh, I think it was about uh, 19 of them have been backfilled. I think we're unwrapping the power boxes. <laughs> but, oh, right. Power box, sorry. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I'm one off. Thank you. Thank you. And the power boxes have been filled. Okay, Councillor Zakor has spoken in favor of the anti graffiti wraps on the power boxes. Any other discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Item 8 is the 2010 second trimester report. The staff recommendations that Council receive this report for information. Second. second. Moved by Councillor Lynch, second by Councillor McDonnell. Councillor Zakor? Yeah, thank on you very the, much. Uh, trimester report. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this time for sure. Okay. Thank you. At the end of August, there's uh, 49 vacancies, which represents 6.38%. Uh, uh, and I understand that out of the 49 vacancies, there was 19 backfilled on a temporary basis. Uh, so that means that there's 30 vacancies. That, but this goes on uh, year after year after year. It seems to me that Quite often we have maybe 80 vacancies at the end of the year, we still have 30 or 40. Am I correct to the Treasury? Uh, through the Chair, uh, the number of vacancies uh, varies with, with time. Uh, uh, Councillor Sikora is correct that as of August 31st, uh, there was 49, uh, 19 of which were backfilled. Uh, we typically try to uh, uh, go for about a 5% vacancy rate. That's our target. Uh, it's impossible to have all the positions filled all the time, uh, but that will vary depending on the economic situation. Yeah, but I, but I noticed that uh, the same uh, things apply on a year after year, that there's still at the end of the year about 30, 40, sometimes even as high as 50 employees that have not been hired. So what I'm getting at is that taken, taken uh, you know, uh, this uh, 6.38 vacancy rate, that means that it's, uh, if you take it on a total of uh, whatever our millions of dollars are for labor, take 60% of that, that's quite a few million dollars. They can add up to a few million dollars. And I'm wondering why that this is, you know, we're not gonna hire the 30 or 40 uh, employees that we can do without. I don't know why we don't leave that as a vacancy for full year round and give the taxpayers a break on the money that, that normally comes in uh, through vacancies. I noticed that our RCMP has a 10 to 14% vacancy rate. You get 10 to 15% vacancy rate, let's take 10, never mind 14. But let's take 10. It's a $26 million budget, it's $2.6 million break. You know, so those are things that I'm saying that, you know, I, I know that the fire department has vacancies too, but however, what they do because of the vacancy rate, that they have to hire extra people on overtime to, to pay for the overtime and obviously probably have eaten up more than if we hired four more new firemen or something, then they probably we may not have the overtime that they normally would. But in these other cases, uh, Mayor, I'm saying that, you know, we should take a good look at it because that seems to be happening uh, on a yearly basis and I'm a little concerned about it. That we as never have a level playing field as far as taxpayers are concerned. Right, for a couple of clarifications. Uh, first of all, the RCMP, he was referring to 10, 10 vacancies, might be 2.6 million. I assume RCMP officers aren't uh, $260,000 each, but uh, I understand where he's going. Um, what happens with uh, the money saved during vacancy? Oh, one other thing was that there may still be 30 vacancies at the end of the year. I assume that in not all cases it's the same position that has been vacant the whole year. 
Can we get clarification of those items? Uh, yes, uh, there's a lot of questions built into that. Uh, but yes, gen generally, uh, I guess I'd start with uh, 30 positions. Uh, that would probably be roughly about a million and a half uh, dollars. Uh, but they're not the same positions that are uh, vacant all the time. That's continually changing as we hire people and have people leave the organization. And the vacancies don't necessarily span the entire year. Uh, in the past uh, couple of years with the economic downturn, the uh, vacancies have been a tool for us to uh, manage a uh, revenue shortfall. We've now uh, seen signs that we're coming through the revenue shortfall. And as the trimester report says, it looks like we will have a modest uh, surplus of about a million dollars this year, which on a budget the size of the cities is not a, a large surplus. That's about right where we should be. Uh, in terms of the police, they do typically uh, have uh, vacancies uh, and uh, they're continually trying to fill their positions, but we also uh, don't fund uh, our integrated teams and we use the vacancy savings uh, from police to fund the uh, integrated teams. Uh, with respect to fire and their positions, uh, uh, we, we definitely try to avoid situations where uh, we're paying more overtime uh, than we would need to to hire staff. So uh, I will have a discussion with the uh, chief about that. I'm not, I'm not aware of that situation, but uh, typically if we're in situations where we uh, need to uh, uh, work uh, o significant overtime, then we will come to council with those staffing needs. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McLeod, anything to add? Nope. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, Councillor Reamer. I'm uh, just wondering uh, when the uh, Partington Creek Integrated Watershed Management uh, Program will be completed. Mr. McIntyre. Oh, no, sorry. Mm, okay, Mr. Suzak. I'll yeah, I'll take that. Thanks, Thanks, Your Worship. Um, well, it's a timely question. We, uh, we actually met with uh, uh, some senior DFO staff today to uh, sort out some, uh, some process issues. Uh, and, uh, and, and out of that, I have to have some meetings internally uh, with staff. Uh, we're, we are trying to go as, as quickly uh, as we can um, while creating the best, the best plan possible. Um, we thought we would be finished by about this time. We are going to need a, a bit more time. I'm hoping that we don't go uh, much beyond the end of the year uh, or into the very early new year. That's, that's, the, that's the current timeline. And then once that's done, the neighbourhood plan can go ahead and how long are we expecting that to take? Mm -hmm. but just, just, just a further comment. Uh, Jim and I do need to meet regarding the status. Um, because I, I don't want to promise, but we're, we're so very close and we want to meet about, well, should, do we feel confident enough to start uh, that process, even if we haven't got a formal uh, letter yet from DFO? Uh, uh, but generally speaking, uh, we, we do want to have uh, the IWMP uh, fully complete uh, before the neighborhood planning uh, process okay. commences, but we are quite close and we do have to have our internal chat about that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Seeing no other speakers, motion is to receive the report. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Item 9 is a uh, notice of motion to request to the provincial government to increase the minimum wage. Um, the recommendations that Council give consideration the following notice of motion presented by Councillor Sikor and seconded by Councillor Reed at the October 18th regular Council meeting. There are a series of whereas clauses um, and the motion to be considered is now therefore be resolved that the city of Coquitlam call upon the provincial government to eliminate the $6 an hour training wage and increase the minimum wage to $10 per hour. Um, as per procedure bylaw, the movers um, afforded the opportunity to speak first to this item. Now it's the score. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, it's, it's to me, as I mentioned, the fact is that, you know, this minimum wage, a lot of a lot of people are abusing that $6 an hour minimum wage because what they do, you have to work for 500 hours to go up to $8 an hour. And they abuse it by hiring them on a $6 an hour, especially when jobs are hard to get. And just uh, before the 500 hours come into fact, they let the person go and hire another one. Uh, the biggest abuse as far as the minimum wage are concerned is some of the very, very huge companies in our community 
you know, the, I traveled through the gas stations and talked to the young people that are working there. And you'd be surprised how many of them are on $6 an hour, how many of them are $8 an hour. I did catch a couple of them that said, oh no, I've been here for six years, so I'm getting $10 an hour. So, you know, to me, there's too many single parents, too many single parents with small kids. They're working two jobs and never see their kids. Is that what we want our families to grow up with, where, where the kids don't really get time to spend with their parents or really get to know the parents and the parents get to know the kids? I don't think so. And, that, and that's the problem. And since, since uh, I talked to some waitresses too uh, in restaurants, and since HST came along, guess who's hurting? The waitresses did not get the tips that they used to get the tips. So it's a double kind of whammy. And uh, it's unfortunate that British Columbia is the most expensive place to live in, and yet they have the lowest wages. And this, I think, should never ever happen. And frankly, I'm speaking for a lot of people that are in that situation. There's a lot of people that, I bet you today, when, when you had the uh, Share Society here, if you ask them, who are the people that are coming to the food bank, there's a lot of people that are working for minimum wage are going to the food bank that they can make ants meet with the rents nowadays and a few other things. And how many, how many children? go to bed hungry. And to me, I, w I never thought I'd ever see the day where a child in British Columbia would go to bed hungry. That is something that I cannot take it, I cannot stomach it. It makes me sick to my stomach to think that there's some child in British Columbia is going to bed hungry because, a, because of the minimum wage. So frankly, that really bothers me. So I'd hope that we not only send this, uh, that we pass this, but I'd like to see it go to the GBD municipalities and also to each community in, in British Columbia. Thank you, Councillor Lynch. Thank you, well, I'm gonna start by uh, just commenting that we at one time talked around the council table about not discussing at length items that are in the realm of the provincial government and stuff like that, and I still think that we, we shouldn't be going to long, detailed discussions. I'm going to support this. I've supported the last two times the same resolution came forward with a minor variation. Um, I'm not optimistic it's going to change anything because it didn't change anything the first two times, and uh, I don't see any desire on the behalf of the provincial government to, to uh, look at this. Um, I've talked with our the new Minister of Labour, who was the old Minister of Labour before he was in there with business. and. Um, it's, it's a nice thought, but uh, I'm not holding any real hope that this is going to change anytime soon. But I will support it. Thank you. Councillor Asmussen. Well, my comments are similar. I supported this last time. This was about two years ago. A motion was put forward through this council, supported by this council. It also went on to the UBCM at that time and raised it to the UBCM. Um, I can support it again. It hasn't had traction. Maybe this time it may. Um, but we, we have done this a couple of times and supported this type of idea. And... We'll do it again, I guess, but it's, it's nothing new to the provincial government. But I think it's a worthwhile endeavor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nicholson. Thank you, Your Worship. Obviously, I'm going to speak in support of this. I understand Councillor Asmundson, Councillor Lynch's comments, but I think we have to deliver the message that this community believes that that increase is appropriate. But I'd like to take it a little further. Uh, I'm not going to make a motion at this time, but Councillor Sikora suggests that it's inappropriate, that it's just wrong that children should go to bed hungry in our province, in our community. I'm very much afraid that should the province increase the minimum wage to $10 an hour, that's not going to make a difference. Children will still go to bed hungry in this community and in lots of communities in the province of British Columbia. Our neighboring municipality in New Westminster last year took a step themselves instead of telling others what to do and ask and put in place a living wage policy, a policy that provides for a minimum level of living for a family of four, both parents working, a little bit of money to provide for some further education and help to work your way out of that, not enough to buy a home, just enough to get by on. In New Westminster, that's $16.74 an hour. 
the aggregate cost to the city of New Westminster for the city and its contractors was $150,000 in a city with a $77 million budget. I'd invite my fellow councillors to talk about this amongst ourselves and consider whether our city might take such a move as our next step. Thank you. Thank you. I will speak as well. Um, I got real concern. I've expressed it before. Uh, as a councillor, I used to walk out when we, had council, when we had council motions directing other levels of government what we thought they should do. Um, we have mandates. We have a mandate here to do all kinds of work at the local level. Uh, we have a lot of work that we don't get to in council meetings. Uh, we have a lot of uh, issues that continue to try to find agenda space on council meetings. And so I've spoken before against the idea that we're going to have, as Councillor uh, Lynch himself said, uh, these long debates about uh, issues that we don't get. That's not, the public didn't elect us to decide uh, what the minimum wage will be in, in British Columbia. Um, and we don't, we don't have that as a mandate. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to oppose this, but I'm not going to, I'm going to ask us, please, if we could stick to the issues before City Council, the issues that the public elected us to deal with, and uh, leave, the pub leave the issues that the public elected a different level of government to deal with in the hands of the other level of government, or else when we get criticized, uh, or when we try to criticize them for downloading, they'll just turn around and they ignore us because we're uh, biting off part of their mandate. Uh, Councillor Reamer as well. Go ahead. Thank you. I, uh, too, agree that this is uh, not our jurisdiction. Um, however, we're talking about uh, a letter that will be sent to the provincial government. If this were direct action, I uh, might well uh, speak against it. I do have concerns about a uh, hike from $8 an hour to $10 an hour. Um, however, I'll, I'll leave that to the provincial government uh, to worry about. I, I'm worried about how something like that would be implemented. Many of our small businesses are still trying to get their books back to black as we move out of the recession. And I'm concerned that a large minimum wage increase at this time could result in job layoffs and less hours for workers and less economic activity as small business owners facing increased costs cancel their plans to expand and to hire and are forced to consider cutting other variable costs further. So I'm actually concerned that if, if we do too large an increase that um, uh, this is going to have a, a negative impact on our kids and the wages they earn. I think it's really important that we uh, maintain um, a strong economy um, first and foremost and that that is really the best way to ensure that the minimum wages um, will, will stay high. Um, as I say, I'm not going to oppose this uh, because it's a letter to the provincial government. However, uh, I do have some concerns about how something like this might be implemented should the provincial government choose to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lynch. Uh, Sorry, I just wanted to clarify something because perhaps I was unclear. It's not that I don't think this, this council should, shouldn't take a, a stand on something like this, but what I think perhaps in the procedural bylaw should say, if we're going to discuss writing a letter on a provincial issue, limit the debate to two minutes per councillor and go to the, to the vote. Just yeah. keep it short and simple and make a stand if you want to. Something worth considering. Thank you. Councillor Reid. Um, just one quick comment. Um, I was a single parent. It's really hard to raise your kids in any event, but it's certainly going to be hard in these day and age to raise them on $10 an hour, especially because you probably wouldn't have a car and you're going to have to rely on transit. And I guess Councillor Asmussen would know more than anybody else, but it costs a lot of money to take the bus and the SkyTrain to work and back, and you're probably going to even at $10 an hour have to work at least two, maybe two and a half hours just to pay for your transit, just to get back and forth to work. So um, this is actually an embarrassing thing to ask, have to ask any government to raise a wage in British Columbia just so that people can afford to go back and forth to work and at least put one meal a day on the table. And that's why I'm supporting it. Thank you. Seeing no others on the debate. Uh, motion is before us. All in favor? Opposed? Carries without opposition. Thank you. We have one additional on table item. Um, this item, item 10, concerns Metro Vancouver Board appointment for the number 12, 2010 board meeting. Uh, copies of this are on the table at the back. The recommendation is that council approve Councillor Lou Secor as an alternate to Mayor Richard Stewart for the November 12th Metro Vancouver Board of Directors meeting. Moved by Councillor Reed, seconded by Councillor Nicholson. All in favor? Opposed? 
carried unanimously. Thank you, Your Worship. There are no f other formal items on the agenda. Well, I actually want to offer uh, Councillor McTonnell a short opportunity as well to comment about the grand opening of a beautiful facility on the weekend. We got to see the, the Poirier Sports and uh, Leisure Complex uh, finally get you know, opened fully 10 months in ahead of schedule and millions of dollars under budget. Uh, lots of people participated. A really exciting day. Councillor McDonnell, do you have anything to add? Uh, I know you want to thank a few people. Councillor McDonnell's microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a, it was a Oops, great just a second. It was a great day, and it's, and it's a wonderful facility for anybody who hasn't been up there to check it out yet. The highlight of the day for me wasn't so much looking at the facility. It was the fact that, um, well, when politicians have a chance to speak, we tend to go on, we thank each other. But what struck me uh, during the course of all the thanking was the amount of private citizens, uh, sports groups, um, interested people that uh, got together, that sat through charrettes, that um, put their time and energy into making sure that this facility is uh, top-notch and second to none. And uh, to me, that speaks, that speaks volumes about a healthy community when um, the majority of thanking goes out to, uh, not to the politicians, but to the people uh, that will be using those facilities. Outstanding, yes. Uh, and I, I do want to, uh, I want to acknowledge staff, all of those community groups, and on behalf of Council, thank everybody that was involved in this project that uh, turned out a great success and will serve this community for decades, just like the original facility did. Okay. Any other comments? Seeing none, uh, motion to adjourn would be in order. Moved by Councillor Askinson, second by Councillor Nicholson to adjourn. All in favour? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Uh, as is our uh, standard procedure, we allow a question period on tonight's agenda. The question period is 15 minutes long. Please, uh, we're not taking statements. These are questions for Council, primarily for clarification. Does anyone have any questions on tonight's agenda? Ms. Dunny, please come forward, state your name and address for the record. Uh, Judy Donahue, 3165 Fox Street in Port Coquitlam. Thank you. And yes, I wanted to speak um, you spoke about mandates, accepting mandates, that your mandate was full with municipal issues, and I agree with that. And that this is, again, to do with 3030 Gordon Avenue. Um, it is my understanding that, looking at the statistics, that um, the Homeless for Good uh, group in Port Coquitlam has drawn up on the homeless population that 88% of these folks have a, uh, are known to have a drug or alcohol or other substance dependency. Oh, sorry. If you, if you point the microphone right at your mouth, then it'll like, <laughs> there you go. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. 88% um, of homeless people in the survey had, were found to have a drug and alcohol or other substance dependency, and 37% have a mental illness, and some have both. Um, it is my understanding that mental illness is uh, the province's mandate, is it not? Absolutely, yes. And that's why on the Riverview Hospital site, there's big billboards saying transforming mental illness into mental wellness. And it would seem appropriate. Uh, Judy, I, I just, this isn't a public hearing, so. No, I'm, I'm aware of that, but I'm saying. Do you have a question on tonight's uh, agenda? This property is being rezoned, and I thought this was happening tonight, that you were voting on rezoning 3030 Gordon Avenue to major institutional use for the shelter portion. Yes, there was some uh, misinformation that was circulated about what was happening tonight. Tonight, uh, tonight was the motion, the first reading and the motion to send it to public hearing. But will that, prop following that, that process, will you be voting on rezoning that property to there major will be institutional use? There will be a vote on the, mo on the proposal, which is to rezone the property and to change the OCP. That vote will take place after the public hearing. I can't tell you which way it will go. Uh, it will depend no, on but it will be rezoned will to major institutional use. If the vote is yes, if yes. That's, that's the proposal, to okay. rezone it to accommodate a homeless shelter, yes. As major institutional. As a homeless shelter, I'm sorry. Um, Mr. Mr. McIntyre, can you shed light on what I think her question is? Uh, yes, certainly, Your Worship. Let me just grab that report. There was, uh, the site is being rezoned. Well, first, there's the official community plan amendment. 
and that's the overarching plan. And uh, so that, in part, is going to um, the major institutional. Um, okay, it goes to the civic institutional. It would be the uh, official community plan designation for that portion of the site. That's the eastern third of the site that's proposed for the facility. The balance of the site would be for general commercial. And along with the OCP amendment, there would be a rezoning application. Again, the eastern third of the site would be for the P1 civic institutional zone and the balance of the property would be for the C2 general commercial. So that, those would be the, the four bylaws before council, or actually the two bylaws before council at the public hearing uh, at the end of the month. Okay, because my concern was that major institutions for people with mental health issues belong, properly belong at Riverview and not within okay, the community. So that's a, I understand, and that's what the purpose of the public hearing will be, is okay. to hear people's concerns That's what concerns I thought was happening here It's not major tonight. institutional, it's civic institutional. But uh, in any case, that's that's what the public hearing two weeks, three weeks from now will we'll address. Okay. Um, Four weeks, actually. Great. Um, do you have, do you, all of you on council have those statistics? I spoke uh, with you, Greg. I, I welcome, I spoke I welcome with, uh, you emailing them to us. Um, okay, well, I have them here tonight. I, I spoke with Greg Moore a few weeks ago. We certainly can receive them tonight. We can receive them any time up until the 29th. So if you okay. want to hand them to the uh, city clerk, we'll... Okay. Uh, we'll I also just... have 232 signatures on a petition that I've been uh, circulating. Ms. Donnie, this is for questions associated with the, tonight's agenda. You, we yes, can't, uh, well... The rules are... I was doing no, that. there aren't comments. It's not an argument. It's not a, a no, debate about I'm just, it. No, I'm just submitting this. I, I understand that. You can submit anything you would like to the clerk because, now or any time between now and the 29th. Um, it was, uh, if you wanted to appear as a delegation before council, you could do so. You, you weren't deferred to a committee. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't understand your question now. Uh, years ago, and I understand this has changed, um, people cannot just appear as a delegation to council. Um, well, well, it's true that when we didn't have standing committees, uh, delegations weren't referred to standing committees because we didn't have them. We now have them and council has adopted the policy that the delegations as a matter of course get referred to standing committees. Sometimes uh, was, it's useful to address the whole of you when you're all together. That, in that, that, that's fine and we do have all kinds of opportunities for that too. We had a town hall meeting a few weeks back. There will be a public hearing on this very issue in four weeks time and we'd urge you to, to come okay. on out and, and make your issues known and email us anytime between now and then or discuss it with us individually. Okay. Thank you very much. So I'll just submit. That would be fine. Perfect. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions for council? Seeing none, thank you very much for coming.